Vivi, three, two, one, go. Hello, hello. This is Ignacy Tsiwczyk, Portal Games. And this is the podfather of gaming, Stephen Bonacor. You are listening to Board Games Insider, episode 234, and we're recording it on April 29th, 2022. Board Games Insider is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, and Ignacy, Tom Vassell listens to me on live streams. Last night, we were playing Gloomhaven online, as I've mentioned here, and he said, you should watch what you're saying online and stop that cursing. I was like, what? Then he told me that he saw me on my appearance on the full 42. It's a small live, live stream, and I helped promote it, of course, because I was going to be on it. And since they're not on the Dice Tower Network, I might have dropped an F-bomb or two, and because they were doing it as well. So I just... Could, you know, I just got into the flow of the general banter. So the point here, Tom Vassell listens to my stuff there. That is interesting. Like if maybe he's a hidden fanboy of you and, and <laughs> he and he listens everything that you are doing and he's just pretending that he hates you. This is a really a twist, like a, in a good, good story. I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. So tell me a story about Portal Games. Portal Games, we are living one big story that is Batman Everybody Lies, preparation to release this week we send out, uh, last week we send out in America, this week in Europe, review copies. Uh, so we are eager to see what people will say, uh, the influencers about the game, then we will ship uh, pre-orders and then all local games will have the game. Now, I was talking about this game for many, many weeks already, but maybe just a super short three or two minutes a description of what the hell is Batman Everybody Lies. Uh, it's a deduction game. It's a cooperative game. We are all playing together. We are trying to solve the mystery. There are three mysteries in the box and one prologue, super simple uh, case uh, to begin with. And you are talking to co cooperatively, discussing what you discovered, what you learned, uh, what it may mean, and what you are using. You are using a deck of cards. The game comes with 23 cards. In each card represents a crime scene or questioning a suspect or some witness. And you are reading this one card. And then at the table, you are arguing and discussing and pointing out what was interesting, what was maybe crucial, what was this piece of information that may be important for the whole thing. And then after you read this card, if after you analyze, you move on to the next card. And once again, you read the card, you learn something and you debate. The whole gameplay, the, the, the challenge of the gameplay is that there is a 23 cards, um, but do we as a designers allow you to read only about 10 or 11 cards, depends. Uh, Steven said he read more cards when he played. Uh, <laughs> but basically you have your choice, but basically you will read only half of the cards. And from only half of the information that we provided in the deck, you have to deduct. You have to uh, figure out what happened, who was the killer, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a brain, brainstorming improvisation game. You're brainstorming and discussing and debating. If you like a game is when you talk a lot and discuss and argue. If you like reading, because each of the cards has some uh, text to read. If you like uh, deduction and crime stories, this is the game for you. Now, there is no miniatures, there is no dice rolling, there is no uh, resources management. This is a completely different game. This is, a, as we call it, the game night experience. You put the soundtrack of the Gotham on your Spotify. <laughs> now, you have your coffee, you have your drinks, you have a lot of notes. I don't know how you played, Stephen, if you made a notes, because there's a lot of names, lots of places you have. You no. Know, and yeah. you just go with the flow of the story. Yeah, so I mean, I, I love the fact that, you know, you're, you're playing one of the seminal characters in the Batman universe. You're, and and, I'll, and I, I can say this because as soon as you open the box, you say you don't play Batman, yep. not to say that you're not going to meet you're, him. You're, you're an ally Who knows? of him. Yep. You're an ally of Batman. And I, I mentioned, and I, I think I mentioned, but I, I, I can say it again. As soon as you open the box, you see this. See, I was Catwoman. And I was, Catwoman? Ro I was oh role-playing <laughs> Catwoman. I was like, yes. I was, I was like doing all this stuff. It, it, was, it, was so, it was so engrossing and fun. And you meet other characters from, you know, from the Batman universe as you're going through the deck to try to solve the, uh, the case. I, I had a great time with it. Uh, we did... 
fair, not great, but fair. But yes, I do recommend take notes. Uh, we didn't take enough notes on things, and that that hurt us. But yeah, very yeah, good. Stuff. Deduction game. You have to remember uh, what happened, when happened, who was there, how he was looking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you mentioned you played Catwoman. That reminds me, each of the characters has uh, some small personal agenda, and uh, they have to follow. Uh, and it's also fun because we play cooperative. This is not a semi cop. This is a full cop. But each of you has some small secret. Each of you has a different angle to the story. And with the Catwoman, we had as a dev team the most fun because she's not a cop. She's not a policeman. She is involved in this case, but so so. She, yeah, she might, you know, want to do something else as well as help solve this case. Uh, so this is Batman for everyone who was wondering uh, what this game is about. Of course, you can visit batman.portalgames.pl uh, and we have a uh, lot of videos and articles about the game. But basically, it is happening. This is the most important release for me of, of the year. This is a game I was uh, designing for many, many months, so I'm very proud. So please check it out. If you're a fan of the show, Batman Everybody Lies uh, dropping to stores uh, in May very, very soon. And what's happening about what's happening in uh, HQ? things are happening that is UK Game Expo. Uh, after a two years break, uh, we are once again going to UK Game Expo. I don't know if our listeners remember, but in the meantime, Brexit happened. <laughs> so there is lots of new things that we have to learn, lots of new things that we have to prepare, lots of uh, concern about the transfer of the game to the show. And as we mentioned many times in, the, in this podcast for years, because it happens every convention that some of the publishers don't have the product on the site because of the troubles the transport and every year on every convention there is some random publisher who has this super unfortunate event now the brexit with the borders with this additional paperwork we are double checking and triple checking everything that our track with gutenberg because gutenberg will be pre-released there make it to the to the convention because if you have this track instead of friday on monday it is after the convention. We don't need this Gutenberg on Monday. <laughs> right. Right? It doesn't <laughs> help sitting in, in the UK on Monday. So it this, really only works if it's there before that. <laughs> so all these all this transport companies, uh, we don't want to hear that it was just one day delayed. It is no, like a no. whole convention. So uh, very stressful moment uh, to prepare for the convention after the Brexit, but we are learning and preparing to do our best. And, uh, if you are at UK Game Expo and if you want to be part of our booth, we are looking for volunteers, uh, so please reach me at portal and uh, uh, at portalgames.pl. And of course, as every publisher at the show, we offer you snacks, drinks, uh, have fun, and of course, free games, free gear, play mats, etc., etc. We are going to demo Gutenberg, amazing games. So if you want to have a copy of Gutenberg, and if you want to teach people how to play the game, reach me, uh, and we will. Have a great time at UK Game Expo. This is what's happening. So basically, Batman is happening and UK Game Expo is happening. And uh, as I see, because uh, I'm recording and I see Steven, I see that we have a record. Record is a second time in a row we are recording from your house. So this is like congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been home for for a little while, <laughs> and we'll record again next week uh, from here. But uh, that doesn't mean I'm staying. Um, so. Well, and, and I am recuperating, you know, as, as I mentioned last time, I had just gotten home from the gathering of friends. Uh, so it was a very light week of gaming uh, after the insanity of gaming that is the, the gathering of friends. And, and as everybody knows, right, that's a, uh, an event that Alan Moon throws, and it's only about hanging out, gaming, designers come play prototypes, and we socialize and we go out to nice meals and stuff like that. Um, it's a fantastic time. This week, I only played one game, and that was Witchstone by r and Games. Uh, I had talked about this in the past. I um, picked, I played it, um, yeah, for the first time at PAX Unplugged, bought it on the spot because I just loved it. I think the game flows so well. It's, it's almost like you're playing six different mini games, okay. all Euro style games within a game, but they link together in a great way. So many, many, many different ways to score points. So, And it's designed by, amazingly enough, Reiner Kinesia and uh, another designer whose name nobody's gonna remember. 
Um, I won't say that I have a feeling that he did most of the design only because it doesn't play like any other Knizia game. It plays like a Feld game. It really plays like a Stefan Feld game because of its many ways to score points. Um, are, you saying, are you saying that Mr. Dr. Knizia is a rather face of the project than the brain of the project? I would say that this game was presented to him by his good friend, whose name I don't remember. <laughs> And they then worked on it a little bit more, and it was released with Dr. Kinesia on top. That's, I mean, I don't know that, <laughs> but that's how it feels. It's a, but it's a great game. Who cares who designed the game, right? That's the most important thing. It's a really great game. It looks fantastic on the table uh, with um, both some wooden pieces and some, like, plastic uh, crystals, and they call them, and other things called energy pieces, so you're doing like all the, you're doing root building, you're doing uh, resource management, you're doing all of these little mini things together, a little bit of a race thing going on on one side of the board. You're going to love this game if you're a fan of like filled type games, Witchstone brought to the English market by r, &R Games. That's all I'm going to talk about there, remodeling. There is, there, yeah. is many, there is many voices in the internet, people are asking if you can at least make up some stories about remodeling because they love the segment. <laughs> okay. Uh, the only thing I'll say is there will be more things to do to the house. There you go. Uh, you are our hero. <laughs> yeah, but this one will be much less dramatic unless the HOA gives me you a You never problem. know. You never know. <laughs> I hope it'll be a little less dramatic. But that's all. I, I don't have anything else on Ramallah. I'm just enjoying my house right now. How's that? I do have to buy some furniture, like for this ugly office right here. But besides that, everything's fine. But on the like on the the, the trips and conventions and stuff like that, I mentioned last time uh, that I was going to see a couple of concerts, like almost back to back. One was on Thursday, and one was on one was on Friday, and one was on Sunday of last week. And I saw the Who at the Hard Rock. A casino and hotel down in Fort Lauderdale. Um, good show, not great show. It's funny that Roger Daltrey, who's a who's a who's the god, vocal god. He just didn't have the power that he had when I first saw him in 1979. I found out that it was 1979 when I first saw him. I might have mentioned 78 last time. Um, so. Townsend was amazing. The guitar player, Pete Townsend, he shredded that guitar like he was in his 20s. Um, overall, if you've never seen The Who um, or you're a fan of them, see them. If not a big deal to you, then I would pass on this show. But the second show that I saw was Elton John. Again, like the third time I've seen him on this tour in Tampa, Florida. I spent a couple of nights up in Tampa um, with my brother and some friends. Again, he's just at 76 years old just amazing still rocking it the band is incredible and he brings actually a small band with him there's only like seven people on stage who had a um um had an like a, a string orchestra behind them to fill in more of the sound i guess still was not a loud concert but it was interesting it's like 30 pieces of strings behind them elton seven piece band couple of percussionists guitars uh uh keyboard and and elton and it was just fantastic if you've never seen elton john play this is his last and he promises his last tour because he wants to he's older he wants to stay at home with his family now that's what he wants to do so see elton john if you get a chance i'll be in hawaii yes i'm going to hawaii for two weeks in about a week and a half from now uh so we'll have a problem doing some recording from out there uh, but um that's going to be a great time i love hawaii going out with some local friends um, from Florida. They've got a two-bedroom timeshare. We're going to go to Oahu. I'm going to go to the Big Island as well. And I'm going to meet Zev, good old Zev Slossinger, now from WizKids. He happens to be there almost exactly the same dates as us. So we'll see him a little bit on Oahu. I'll see him a little bit on the Big Island. That's going to be so much fun uh, to spend some time with him as well. Um, and then as far as what's happening after that, BGG Spring. Not sure if... Um, I'm going. I, I'm going to try, but it's so close to uh, to the Hawaii trip. And uh, and then at Origins, I'll have a big announcement for what I'm going to be doing at Origins, but I'll save that for the end of the show. Last thing I'm going to mention again, like I did last week, is 
Eric Hanwies, who is the owner, president of Flatlined Games out in Belgium. He released a book that I'm showing now to people who watch us on YouTube. It's called Board Game Publisher. It's better than a real job. And you can get this book multiple places, including Amazon. And I have not read the book yet, but it's a complete look at everything you do when you're a board game publisher. Um, Eric's had some success in the industry, but he certainly knows all the things that you need to do to get games done. He goes through the different types of components, the different different types of printing, ink coverage on on printing, uh, scheduling. It's 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 a an entire tome of knowledge about what we do as publishers. 268 pages of goodness board game publisher. It's better than a real job by Eric Hanwies from Flatline Games. Eric, thank you um, for doing this book. I hope that it does very well for you. And uh, let's move on to the event deck. I have one news that is not listed in this show notes and it's okay. very important and we need to start with this one. All right, let's do that. Are you ready? I'm ready, man. Nominations for Golden Geek Hours were done. And Board uh -oh. Game Insider is not there. We were not nominated. I'm, 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 I'm beside myself. Oh, oh, Ignacy, how could that happen? Are you there? I'm here. Yes. <laughs> I'm very sad. Um, well, I will be. I will be Slavic for the next year. <laughs> Why did our fans desert us? I guess we didn't publicize that it was happening, so nobody went over. I guess I mean, right? Think about it. If we don't talk about it, and I know that Matthew Jude did talk about it on his podcast on um, this game is broken. So probably they got a lot of our. You know, because we we are kind of our, tied, tied to them in our, some way. Our listeners, you need to vis visualize the situation. Ignacio opens board game geek. He goes to the news. He looks at the podcast. He doesn't see us, and he cries. He cries a long, long hours. Uh, I'm sad too. But you know, Ign well, Ignacio, we have to we have to move on. Life continues. Okay. <laughs> So we do have some good news about people moving in the industry, moving around and, and, and going for other things and doing other things for themselves and other companies. First one is a very good friend of mine, Danny Lowe, uh, is now hired by Hachette, which we've talked about a lot. Hachette Board Games has hired Danny Lowe as their new North American marketing manager for English speaking markets. She will start at her new position on April 25th, so she's just started. Lowe is a seasoned veteran in the game industry, having worked for Gamma, Renegade Game Studios, and Yellow USA over the course of her career. Prior to being hired by Hachette, Lowe had been the marketing manager at Pandasaurus Games since 2020, uh, where she maintained relationships with customers and media and created event experiences for board games. So um, good friend of mine, um, really wonderful person, really smart. Um, happy for her. Uh, I'm sure she's gonna be missed at Pandasaurus, but you know things have to things have to change for people. So I think this is a uh, this is good overall for Danny. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this for sure good. This is for, the for Hatchet is a great great hire and is absolutely great news for uh, Danny. Of course, Pandasaurus is a great game company as well, but Hatchet is uh, as we see the one of the major players in upcoming years. So this is a, a great step. Mm, uh, and only Panazaru's team is not happy, I guess. Absolutely. And the other one is near and dear to our heart here, and that's Luke Otfinowski has joined Ultra Pro as the new director of sales and entertainment. So Luke, who was the U.S. representative from Portal Games for four years, give or 2000, take? 2018. For four years, I got it. Yep. Um, has now, he's left Portal Games and is now with Ultra Pro, which is a very big company. And um, I'm sure we both wish him great times uh, in his new role there. And Luke, um, Ignacy will, will say more, but I, you know, Luke is 
absolutely one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And the guy, when he, he, he worked with the same um, CPA that I work with to do taxes, you know, for, um, for, for the U S division of portal games and the CPA, who's a good friend of mine said to me, this guy, Luke is amazing. He's just like, he's learned everything like this. And he's just sends exactly the information I need every time. Of course, what he was saying was that I never sent him the right information. So I was screwing things up, but Luke, Luke had it right every time. So Ignacy, anything you want to add to Luke? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we show Luke all the best. Absolutely. He came to the portal games uh, and he changed the company. He improved it on every single level. Uh, he cleared a lot of the problems that we had before. He left the company in uh, amazing, amazing condition. And uh, it's a new chapter for him. It's a new chapter for us. But uh, we remain in a private contact. We remain friends. Uh, he's still uh, giving me some advices, et cetera, et cetera. We will meet at the Dice Tower, obviously, in Florida. So uh, also, also, I'm very sad because uh, like Pandazaru's team, uh, they probably loved Danny. I absolutely love their look. Mm -hmm. uh, but absolutely, I wish him uh, all the best in this uh, new part of the career and Ultra Pro. Got amazing, amazing hire and uh, congratulations. Excellent. Yeah, Luke, all the best to you, my friend. And he's leaving, sadly. He was a neighbor of mine and he lived in yes, Boynton he's Beach. Moving. Yes, he's, he's moving. moving. So we'll not be able to see Luke here. So this one, very quickly, I'm going to mention. Asmodee is releasing Drinkopoly. What? Yeah, they're releasing Drinkopoly, a social board game for adults that features wacky and lighthearted rules that are perfect for parties. It's a pure drinking game that keeps guests a little tipsy while they learn truths about each other. What? Okay, so while that is true, it's not exactly true because the game is actually being released by Lion Rampant and Asmodee now is their distributor in North America. But the, the release talks about Asmodee releasing Drinkopoly. Um, I found that really weird because like, uh, why would uh, Asmodee release that type of game? They would not under their own brand. That is, yeah, this is a very weird news and uh, I'm really surprised. I mean, I know these are the contracts that they sign the distribution deal and they take the titles, but this is so much opposite of the message, the main message they have. And we just uh, discussed the last week, uh, the, the whole new label they have <clears throat> to promote the games to families and new people. And then you have a Drinkopoly. Mm -hmm. Let's not add to this press coverage of this news. Like, let's try to hide this, this, this news, okay? So <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else do we have here, Ignacy? We have- oh, Exploding Kittens, uh, Eric Lang tweeting like crazy about this, being so excited. His uh, Facebook profile, his Twitter profile, everything about uh, this big news. And he's saying, I was keeping this in secret for so long and I can talk about this. And Netflix is making an Exploding Kittens TV series and mobile game. So um, if Exploding <laughs> Kittens is still part of your party game repertoire years later, Netflix has just the news you were hoping to hear. The streaming service is introducing an exclusive version of the Exploding Kittens mobile game, as well as an animated TV series. The adult-oriented show will be executive produced by card game creators Elon Lee and Matthew The Oatmeal Inman, as well as veterans like Mike Judge, and will star well-known personalities, including Lucy Liu and Tom Ellis. That's Tom Ellis was in Lucifer and Lucy Liu is in Kill Bill and other things. I mean, big names. The series revolves around a holy war that sees God and the devil visit Earth in the former in the form of beefy house cats. God and the devil will be fat house cats. It won't stream on Netflix until 2023, but the upgraded game is due in May with two new cards and promises of future gameplay based on the show. I don't, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm like, really? I mean, I like cats. I mean, that's the best thing. I know you don't like cats, but that's the best part of this. this what I'm reading, like, this, this is going to have like two arguing cats, I guess. One is God and one is the devil. For, for sure, for us, what is a, a, the crucial part of this news is that uh, usually we cover that there mm -hmm. is a board game done from the TV show, from the movie, from the book. And here we are having TV show made 
from the board game. Obviously, the first the board game was a very popular comic in the internet, uh, but basically this is like a opposite direction than usually. So congratulations to the brand, Exploding Kittens, congratulations to the, the whole team who is uh, managing the, the whole project. I'm not saying that I'm going to watch this show. It's, it, it's not uh, my type of the shows, um, but definitely congratulations to Eric and everyone involved in this, uh, in this brand. Absolutely. Ignacy, I'm going to overrule you a little bit here. I'm going to go to the next story just very briefly because there's not much to talk about. But Gen Con oh. has published their exhibitor list. Is this not something you wanted to talk about? No, no, it is, it is not a short news. Okay, let's go. With it. Okay. No, I think this is very short news. They published the exhibitor list. And the thing to notice about the exhibitor list is that Asmodee, all of its studios, is listed again. So Asmodee is back. That's all. And and Simon is on there and uh, WizKids and I, everybody that I would have expected in a Gen Con 2019 is there. So that's all I was going to say. Are you listed? Is Portal listed? I, I didn't check, but I guess. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't, so you... don't make me on the live stream that I'm... Uh... Losing my booth at the show. Okay. <laughs> uh, Portal Games is listed, right? And, uh, you know, Indie Boards and Cards and Stronghold Games are listed. So we're, you know, all the people that you would expect are listed. So that's why I think it's short news. It's just that it sounds like going to be Gen Con as usual. Isn't that good? It is very, very good. And a uh, few few weeks ago, we discussed that Asmodee didn't come to can and I was predicting maybe and they will not go to the other shows as well. But here is a situation here yeah, they are going to Gen Con. So uh, apparently, the can in France was just a different story. Right, exactly. All right, let's get over to strategy and tactics. <clears throat> All right, we've got Kurt W, who's the corset maker. Nice. Of the 200 or so games I've played in my life, very few have tiebreaker rules that I find satisfying. Many feel like complete afterthoughts to the design process. In designing a game, when do you start thinking about tiebreaker rules and how much effort goes into them? Are there any games that you can think of with particularly good tiebreaking rules? I think my favorite is Arboretum. In the event of a tie, both players plant a tree. After five years, the player with the tallest tree is declared the winner. Well, Kirk, I wasn't sure where you were going with this at first. At first, I was like, I think you're worrying too much, Kirk, about like the tiebreaker. The tiebreaker is going to be, you know, the most resources. Most It's going to be something. But I agree with you 100% that Arboretum has the single greatest tiebreaking rule of all time. Because I knew I've heard of this. I have, I have Arboretum. And that is amazing, right? I mean, think about it. It's all about trees the game <laughs> and it tells you plant a tree so all this tree wins five years later <laughs> ignacy any other good ones you know are you like you can't talk what's going on no 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 man so <laughs> i want to be honest <laughs> i don't know where you're going with this go ahead be honest but he, Kirk said, many of these tiebreakers, many feel like complete afterthoughts to the design process in designing. And this is true. Well, right. <laughs> like, and I mean, I mean, yeah, you we never finish, think. Yes, we've, yes, we finish design, the game is working, and then there is, okay, so what's the tiebreaker? Uh, and you spend 10 minutes or five minutes uh, designing it. Obviously, this is not something that we designers put so much uh, effort to make it so amazing uh, like that this is just like a, yeah. we want players to win the game and this tiebreaker is a rare situation to put there anything etc so my honest answer yes we don't put much thought in these yeah. in these in things yeah and i think and i think that i mean the general idea is here's the game here's what you're going to win on the conditions to win usually victory points right in right in most games uh, something that that sounds like victory points and after that, you look at the next most important thing that happened, so to speak, right? So maybe the most resources that you had left at the game or the, the most you did on a given track that was really Dominic. important to push the game forward. It's, you, you're just going to look at the, the rest of the characteristics of the game holistically and pick something that makes sense and then try to pick several of them because you know people are going to tie on that level and then that level and then... It's going to be the the finally the shared tie, right? 
with Naroshima Hex, we, I have an interesting story. Naroshima Hex is a, a war game, is a tactical game, so we are fighting. So Michael Orach came with a super simple, if there is a tie, you play one more battle, like automatic one more battle, we'll see who will once again kill more people. Yeah? So there's a one automatic battle. And it was working for years, it was super simple, very thematic. This is a final additional battle. Uh, guess what? It was three or four years later. So this is still like 15 years after the release of the game. Uh, one of the players in uh, in Poland during the tournament uh, found a combo of units that makes situation that he is not hitting opponent, but he is but he's immune to get hit. So you are playing one more battle, nothing happened. One more battle, nothing happened, and he just uh, put this game on the loop, and wow. it was impossible to finish the game. <clears throat> uh, now he's moved because you have to make a very smart placement of the of the soldiers but now this move has his nickname like this is this dude play like in a chess really and it is uh, ruled out in the tournaments in poland and like uh, he got his credit that he did it that is possible to loop the whole game and it is ruled out in poland you cannot play this this move so uh, yeah this designer will never predict what these crazy gamers can do. And after 15 years, after the release of the game, some dude figured out how to, how to loop the game. Like in chess, the Sicilian defense, yep. the Roy Lopez, right? They, they've come up with names to, 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 to uh, memorialize such an achievement in something. Exactly. So now exactly. we've got the dude in <laughs> defense, Nourish whatever, yep. whatever it is yep. in Nourish Max. Excellent, cool thing. Tilla Masseria, who's at TM Masseria, Stephen has mentioned how much he loves Lord of the Rings. Yeah, baby, I do. And Ignacy mentioned working on a Dune adventure game. Oh, yes, he has, and it's done. Are there any books that do not have a board game that you feel would be adapted well into games? You want to take a shot? We've talked about IPs and stuff. I mean, I have uh, one. You want to go first? I have one. There is there is a ton of a ton of books that I absolutely love and I could do. As we mentioned, the Dune was my dream come true. And Batman is my dream come true. Uh, I have uh, one of my favorite uh, fantasy series is uh, Black Company from Glenn Cook. It's a uh, military, milita military fantasy, dark fantasy. I'd love to make a game like that. But uh, yes, I'm looking at my library at home and I see only possible great designs. Mine, you know, I, it probably is a game already out there, but it probably is. Yeah, it slipped under my radar. I don't remember it. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the Orson Scott card book. Oh Ender's my God. Game. Ender's Game. For some reason, it went I in. I five went from Poland, one of my favorite book of all time. I mean, it's amazing, right? And, and and that payoff at the end was so huge. huge. Yep. It was amazing. Like the book beginning to end. And, you know, in that book, the author predicted, the author predicted not that he realized what he was doing. The author predicted the rise of social media as driving the discourse, the conversation of the world. Think about it. Think about what you remember from that book, that the two kids were, were, were creating personas to drive a, a, an agenda, multiple agendas, competing agendas about what was going on in the world. And that's what happens now on social media. Incredible. Uh, so, that, and that's only one little part of the book. Obviously, the bigger part of the book is what's going on with this kid's game, right? With Ender, what's going on with Ender's game? Um, so, I think that who knows? Would you do the whole thing? Would you? I don't even know how you could do it, but I think that if you did it and put that IP on it, that could be kind of cool. Yep. All right. David Co. KO, who's at DKL415. COVID has made wealth and income inequality more apparent than ever. How can board games be profitable while also maintaining a low barrier to entry? I mean, I think, David, that they are fairly low barrier, fairly. I mean, not everybody could, people live paycheck to paycheck. They live on government subsidies. It's never, the world is never going to be a fair place. It's just, it's just never going to be a fair place. But for board gaming, we have games that cost under $10. I mean, that's as good as you're going to get, right? There's card games, plenty of them that cost under $10. There's plenty of roll and rights that are under the $20 mark, right? I had a whole series of them that were under the $20 price. So while you, 
we we can't make the big demand, big production games that are going to be reachable to someone living below the poverty line. That's just never going to be able to happen. I think that we produce, some of us do, some of us did, uh, the whole gamut from the most inexpensive, accessible games, especially good ones for families, to the biggest, craziest production games. And and then for people who who can't afford those games, usually they can find them at, at someone else's place or a convention or a meetup where they can then enjoy the game with someone else. Ignacy, anything to add? Yeah, of course. This is a very uh, difficult topic because uh, exactly what you said, uh, different people have different salaries. So the, the scale is different. Mm -hmm. But uh, once again, even if they just mentioned Batman, Batman costs 50 bucks. You can buy it online probably for 35. And this is a free amazing game night for the whole family. So if you invite your family three times to the cinema, I don't know what's the ticket price in, in America. Stephen can Very help high. Me. Very uh, high. So do you now with the Batman game, you get on budget three game nights for the whole family. Yes. For yes. 10 bucks per, 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 per night. So I say it is it is cheap. It is uh, obviously some people may say it is still too much for me, but comparing to that cinema, is it's a good price. Yeah, and 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 Batman and 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 like detective games are a quote disposable, right? Because once you play them, you, you can then pass them on, of course. Yep. But the game is played. Most games don't Stay even forever. have that yep. characteristic. You could play that game that you purchased. And let's say you were able to get something bigger, 50 or a hundred dollar game. You can play that game basically for the rest of your life if you wanted to. So that's how games really are a very affordable alternative for entertainment because exactly. so they sit there on your shelf forever and can be played forever. You buy the comic book, you spend 20 bucks, you read it and it's done. Yes. You buy the board game, you play for another five years. So once again, I fully understand that we have different salaries and somebody may have le less salary, but basically it is a great return on investment in board games because you can play them over and over and over again. Excellent, excellent. Let's get on now to our play testing segment. So last week, Ignasi, you gave the question and that question was, what is your favorite game mechanic? We have, we have, if we play area control, we see the deck, deck building and worker placement win this, uh, this question because most of you guys answer that deck building or, uh, or worker placement. As always, I picked a couple of the uh, replies uh, uh, from you. Adrian says drafting. It is always fascinating how completely different outcomes can be achieved with this mechanism. One player's rubbish is another player's gold. And this is this is exactly like I'm looking at the hand, nothing interesting. I give my hand to another player. Oh my god, amazing card because he has different combos, he has different goals. And the drafting is uh, in this in this case amazing. And he says, This is what transforms games like Blood Rage from good to great. And I absolutely agree with uh, with him. Peter uh, van der Meren says deck building. I love the challenge of optimizing my deck getting rid of bad cards and getting nice combos deck building is also one of my absolute all-time favorites and the third answer i picked today is from andres and he says engine building because me ignace loves engine building as well and he says it is so satisfying to start from the small and end up with the best engine you could have the game is your oyster it includes deck builders bug builders starting that simple splendor um so yeah Engine building, deck building, drafting, uh, what you picked. Yeah, so I agree with you that, um, you know, the uh, those were the biggest ones, the the deck builders, right? Uh, and um, and you also mentioned the worker placement. They were by far the biggest on here. Uh, Mike Dando, he says, like a number of others, my favorite mechanic is deck building. And I also love engine building and bag building, the puzzle of choosing the right options and then getting cool combos and great turns where the engine runs perfectly is really satisfying. Sarah Simpson went with economic games are some of her favorite. Think of a choir and power grid, figuring out how much money you will need in a future turn and how to balance your income and expenses to get the best income. When is the best time to invest versus sell? They have an 
elusive pivot point where you need to change your strategy from start up to end game. But in real life, I don't play the stock market too risky. Very good advice, Sarah. And John Merlaz, he says, uh, I was going to list deck building, but then I saw that co-op play was considered a mechanic. I got interested in co-op mechanics because they can make games less stressful. Too many people, including myself, sometimes take competitive gaming too seriously and get upset when things don't go their way. I'm not Take, I'm not talking tantrums, although I've seen that happen, but just general grumpiness or irritation can bring the experience down for everyone. This can happen when, with even the nicest people, if they're coming off a bad day or something else is going on in life. Playing co-op is where everyone is working together to beat up the game, usually um, keeps this problem from happening. <laughs> so those are really good answers. And I think that in general, right, we have a good splay and that's why we make games for everybody, right? Different mechanics for different people. For What's me, question? my question this week is going to be, what game do you love that most people either do not like or just find it okay or they just don't understand why you love it so much? Nasi, what's your answer to that question? This past Monday, we played After Hours. I brought to After Hours one of my beloved games from Bruno Catalan, Bruno Faidutti, one of the gems in my collection. And one of the players said he hates the game. And we didn't <laughs> play it. And this game that uh, had no success whatsoever. And I don't understand. You guys are all wrong. And the game in question is Boomtown from Bruno Faiduti and Bruno Catala. Brilliant bidding game. And I saw hundreds of copies being sold out for two euro at Essen. And I was crying along with Bruno's because it's one of the, their best games. And I don't know why it didn't catch. Boomtown is that small box game, right? Face-to-face yeah, -face games <clears throat> released that in America. Who did? Face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure I have that in my collection. And I'm pretty sure I either have never played it or I played it like once a long time ago and forgot about it. It's amazing. Since you say it's amazing, I got to drag that out, reread those rules and play that game. Because it also looks good. It's cartoony Wild West, yeah, right? and big, big cards and... Uh... It's really good, and it was. Uh, I bought. I bought so many copies of it for this two euro, brought to Poland, and give away as a gift for my friends, because this game deserved uh, lots of lots of love and didn't get it. That's very very cool. So <clears throat> for next week, we want you to answer this question to us: What game do you love most that people don't like, or they find it just okay? But they don't understand why you love it. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't give mine, Ignasi. So yep, while you're while you're doing your yep, work, yep. so mine is mine is um, betrayal at House on the Hill. Now, okay. yeah, there are some people that do like it, but I love that game. I love that game like in a in a weird way because to me, it's an experience game that you that every time you play it, it, sometimes the game is just broken and it doesn't work. The scenario doesn't work, and really. Watsy, Hasbro, whoever should fix the darn game so that it always works. And I do have the new edition out and I have backed it on their pulse. They, what they call it, the Hasbro pulse thing. Yep. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, if you if you don't like that game, I I understand why you don't like it. But hopefully people will get the fact that to me, kind of almost role playing that haunted house that haunted mansion thing going in and now of course they have the boulders gate version they got a scooby-doo version which everyone called it like the scooby gang anyway that you're going in so i love that experience now please go over to our thread ignasi just created it because i saw him do it he created a thread for you to go answer that question go over to the guild find the play testing thread for the question and post your answer to it and now we get to <clears throat> the final score <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts or now watch Board Games Insider on the Podfather of Gaming YouTube channel. To ask us questions for our strategy and tactics segment, you must post them in the correct thread in our guild on Board Game Geek. To answer our question to you from our playtesting segment, also go to our guild on Board Game Geek and look for the thread with this episode's question. Board Games Insider has a Facebook page, so please like us on Facebook. Also on Facebook, please like Ignacy's page and Steven's page, slash Portal Games US and slash Podfather Gaming. The websites are portalgamesus.com, podfathergaming.com. 
please go there, sign up for the newsletters, and get up to the minute information on what's happening at Portal Games and with the Podfather. On social media, speak directly to Ignacy and Steven. On Twitter and Instagram, it's the same at Portal Games US and at Podfather Gaming. And on YouTube, the channel names are Portal Games Movies, Portal Games Gameplays, and The Podfather of Gaming. And you can catch Ignacy on TikTok, Portal Games US. We hope to see you at an upcoming convention in 2022. Be there. Say hello to us. And by the way, Board Games Insider was professionally edited by Matthew Jude from This Game is Broken podcast. If you'd like him to edit your podcast, please contact him on Twitter or email at thisgameisbrokenpodcast at gmail.com. Also, that great voice you hear doing our intro, outro, and in-between segments is that of Ray Greenlee. He can be contacted to do voiceover work at raygreenleyvoiceover.com. So, Ignacy, I mentioned before that I had something I was going to announce here at the end of the show, and here it is. The podfather of gaming himself is co-hosting Origins TV at the Origins Game Fair. This is going to be piped through the convention center, the big bar on two at the Hyatt, and all the other places, the Gamma at Origins uh, shows their closed circuit TV. It's going to be hosted, co-hosted by B Zelda, who's a very cool person, and they're um, from RPG content creation fame. So myself and B Zelda, we together will have, we'll make a great team from different sides of the hobby gaming. Um, we'll be doing a welcome segment each morning, a closing segment at the end of the show. And we'll, I'll be personally doing this like back row segments that I'll be interviewing the people in the back row, the small companies out there that don't get a lot of like publicity. And I'll also be interviewing some of the biggest companies out there, some of my friends in the industry, so that we can talk about either what they're doing or what the state of the industry is if they'd like to, to do that. So if you're going to be at Origins, look for our pretty faces. Well, B's pretty face and my not so pretty face up on the TV screens around the Origins Game Fair and in the food courts and in the bars and all of that. Uh, I think you're going to have a good time uh, with this little extra content that we'll be creating for all of the Origins attendees. I'm very happy to hear that. I will brief you before Origins so you know how to push and promote our podcast because we were not nominated for Golden Geek. <laughs> We were not nominated for the Golden Geek Award. But I think it might be at least partly our fault we did not publicize it. We would have been nominated if we publicized it like last year. But, yeah. Guys, we still love you, but we're crying. We love you, but inside we've died a little bit. All right, in the meantime, everybody, take care. We'll see you in a week. Bye-bye.